In September 2022, a woman in Iran is killed in police custody because she wasn't wearing her coverings properly. Her death sparked public outrage and people want freedom and stop to the Islamic Republic. People filled the streets and began protesting. One of the government's responses then is to cut off the internet to prevent more riots and upheaval. This isn't the first time they did this. It happened many, many times in the past. It's not exclusive to Iran. It happened in India, Congo, Indonesia, and many more countries by their governments in hope that they will shut off their problems. This creates a problem. It keeps people from connecting with each other. The government may say that this will stop misinformation from spreading, but it would also stop real information from reaching people in need. You need a good deal of real information to live a good life, especially when you want to make important life decisions. The people of North Korea, for example, are kept hidden and isolated from the rest of the world. There's no information in or out, and the regime there kept people captive for decades, and you can see the stark difference between China and North Korea. Our brain also loves information. If you keep learning about new things, your brain will keep making new connections. And that is why some people are protected against dementia because the brain has a lot of roots to access the same information that is otherwise blocked in some people with dementia. When the internet is cut off, the economy suffers. Journalists struggle to document abuse by the government and those that need healthcare don't get enough access to the facility. The governments often argue that it is needed for people's safety, which is mostly lies. And one study found a quadrupling of violence when the internet is disrupted as compared to cases where the internet stays on. Internet manipulation is a violation of people's rights, but it doesn't matter for the countries that couldn't care less about human rights. In 2011, we saw a big upheaval in the Arab world called the Arab Spring Revolution when people demanded democracy. One of the causes of this revolution is because of the connection between people. People use social media and they were also using the dark web to keep their identity hidden from the government and to share information anonymously. The government tried to stop the riots by cutting off the internet, but it seemed to fuel them more. The connection here is in favor of the people, but the interconnectedness can also be used to abuse people. The Chinese mass surveillance program keeps track of their people. They use facial recognition data, fingerprints, and travel history. They use CCTV cameras and AI to analyze the footage. But this big data approach is not only used by China. They're used by many governments around the world, including the US, although not to the extent used by China. People that are living in an oppressive system may or may not realize that they are oppressed. But for those who do, they won't change. So what do people do when they feel oppressed? Well, from what we can see before, they protest. Protests exist when they are the oppressor and the oppressed. It's hard to imagine our early ancestors protesting if there were no large organized groups to protest at. But as society got more complex and we got the powerful controlling the lives of the commoner, so does our problems. One of the earliest recorded histories of protest is the labor strike in 1210 BC Egypt if you count strike as a protest. Egypt was facing an economic decline and the government workers were underpaid, hence the first strike in recorded history. And then in 1381 Britain, we got the peasants revolt only three decades after the Black Death. The people were angered by the poll tax and some key royal officials were killed, but feudalism was on its way out and many plights of the peasant improved. Then we have the Boston Tea Party, the French Revolution, the Luddites, the Socialist Revolution, the Civil Rights Movement, the Thirst for Democracy. And now, in the present day, we have people protesting about race and the climate by throwing food at paintings which... Uh, I don't know. And generally, our standard of living. We can also see that protests are getting more frequent. Some of these protests can highlight one particular problem. Democratic failure. People want real democracy, since many protests were prompted by the perceived failure of political systems or representation. Other themes included inequality, corruption, and lack of action over climate change. You also see some demands for racial or ethnic justice. But there is a growing number of protests focusing on denying the rights of others, like Germany's far-right Pegida movement, the anti-Chinese movement in Kyrgyzstan, the Yellow Vest movement, there is a debate on whether a violent or peaceful protest is more successful. Some say violent ones can scare away potential allies, 
while some say it brings urgency to the issue. Some other people are concerned about property damage and looting, but some studies show that looting only happens only to big businesses, especially those living in capitalistic economies. In 1992, during the Los Angeles riots, when Rodney King was beaten by police, people sprayed minority-owned on businesses so that people would bypass those. But in some other places like Hong Kong, there was no looting. Sure, some protesters smashed shop windows, threw petrol bombs at the police, and defaced the national emblem. But there was no looting. Lawrence So, a specialist in policy and public order management at the Education University of Hong Kong, believes that this happens because those protests were triggered by political developments and anger at the police, rather than discrimination and social inequality, since many of the stores targeted have a strong connection to mainland China. In the past, it was harder to organize a protest, especially before the era of the internet. We used pigeons to postal systems, newspapers, radios, or even word of mouth for communication back then. These organizers also risk getting caught or even killed. The historic march on Washington in 1963 took more than 10 years from being an idea to being organized. But today, we can just organize a protest in a matter of days. Yet, we can express how we feel and what we want, and it's very easy to compare to the past. But does the easiness that comes with it take away the importance of the message that these people are trying to tell? And does protest work, especially when it is all too common? Well, it depends on the government and the people. Many large and widespread protests don't correspond to immediate change. In 2003, people were marching to oppose the impending invasion of Iraq, and it was the biggest protest in human history. But the war and occupation proceeded anyway in March that year. The Occupy movement that expressed opposition to social and economic inequality saw marchers in 600 communities and 70 major cities quickly. But inequality has gotten worse since then. So change is not guaranteed and there is no easy magic wand for change. Talk about difficult. There was a time when a Catholic pacifist broke into a nuclear weapon facility to smear the place with blood. She got three years in prison. Harris' actions can have more impact, especially if they have mass participation. In 1986, Filipinos protested when Ferdinand Marcos wanted to rule through a March election, even after being in power for 20 years. The protesters risked being shot at, which had happened before. However, Marcos ran away when he realized he could no longer control the country. Even though in some circumstances we see that high-risk protest helps, we can say for sure that high-risk protests can scare authorities to implement change because authorities can repress protesters until they give up. And sadly, it works. A state has a lot of power to cause damage that the protesters can withstand. During Arab Spring, one-third of the citizens of Bahrain marched for months, but the government responded with widespread arrest, torture, and executions, silencing the wary population. In July of 2013, Egypt, a military coup happened. Protesters camped in Cairo to oppose the coup, but the military and police opened fire, gunning down around 1,000 people in a single day. Protests died down, and the country is ruled by a military dictatorship. In 1989, the Chinese government killed hundreds or even thousands of protesters in Tiananmen Square, where around 1 million people assembled for months, crushing the pro democracy movement. However, Governments sometimes give in because protests in a way are powerful because they change people's minds. In the long term, they undermine the important pillar of power, legitimacy. Max Weber defined the state by its monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force. The word legitimate is as important as the word physical force, if not more, especially in the modern world. Violence doesn't self-perpetuate, it has to be enabled by the people. The Soviet Union fell because, in a large part, ran out of legitimacy, and its leaders lost the will to live in their own system. The system doesn't bring wealth or freedom, even to winners. Force and oppression may keep things under control for a while, but it would also make such rules more brittle. Legitimacy is important because even though people can be coerced to comply, it's really hard to force enthusiasm, competence, and creativity from discouraged and pinned down people. The shutting down of the internet shows how important the internet is to us. It may have changed the lives of every single one of us. Some people met their loved ones on the internet. Some people might be working on something that they've discovered on the internet. All those deep late night talks with their best friend are possible because of the internet. 
We don't experience the yearning and waiting that the people of the past experience when writing to someone they love, since we enjoy almost instantaneous texting. The content that they watch on TV is limited and confined to their airing schedule while we can watch as we please on the internet. We can book tickets online to travel, use online banking, and get educational materials without interacting with anyone. It transforms not only us individuals, but industries, companies, and environments. They make us feel sociable, funny, angry, excited, or even modern. But it's not all beautiful and sunny. While some people meet their loved ones here, there are people who meet their deaths and some of the worst types of human beings. While some people are finding passion on what they love, some people find bigotry and hate compelling. Some people might have a lot of friends online and play games together, but they only know their nicknames while spending hours and hours alone in their room. Some people prefer to chat via text rather than meeting physically, and when they actually do meet, they're often still glued to their devices. It also led some powerful people to have more access over the control of our lives. China has achieved a chilling achievement, an almost absolute social control, with little physical oppression seen in lower tech authoritarian countries like Iran or Russia. The Uyghurs are an example of such victims. They have their iris, blood, fingerprints, and voice collected by the Xinjiang police, and many of them are detained for using apps like WhatsApp or sometimes determined by algorithms to indicate religious extremism. The internet is neutral. It's not inherently evil or good. It needs to be decided by the people that use it to determine what they're going to use it for. But you can't just tell people to be nice and expect them to behave nicely. They come from different walks of life, and it's just hard to talk to them. You can't really force people to have the same opinion as you, but you can reason with them and tell them why you think so. And when they give their opinions, you can tell them why you don't agree. We need to have an open discussion with them, even though I know it's going to be hard. We have to try to be kind to them and just try to see where they're coming from. Often people forget to be kind to others. Remember, the point is not to really argue to see who comes up with the best arguments, but to reach a consensus for both parties. You don't want angry, unstable people committing crimes against other innocent people just because you just proved their views that the world is full of jerks and that other people don't care about them. You want them to be nice. The internet has been really useful to us. It may have changed our lives forever. Some people found love, some people found death. But it's up to us to steer it in the right direction. While the Iranian media is blaming Israel and Saudi Arabia with their failures, we need to use the internet to the best of our abilities to be on the good side of history.